to Eugene for the lesson study. Um, so if we could start with our very first chorus, it's a, an old one, as Cliff said to me last night, and I actually had to go and Google it again to remember the words. And once I started singing them, I did remember it. <laughs> so yeah, our first one would be, we've come this far by faith. It's also a 19, 1977 recording by the Heritage Singers. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Moustaches, <laughs> the typical 70s moustaches. <laughs> I loved it. Um, I see Cher has joined us too. Good morning, Cher. I'm glad you've joined us. Um, Chris Ockliffe was going to call you just now too because it was just him and I chatting for quite a while. <laughs> but welcome. Thanks, Lucinda. Sorry, I'm having some issues with my laptop. Oh. <laughs> Um, our next chorus this morning is It Only Takes a Spark. It only takes a spark Going. And 
think that is the way I felt this morning. I wanted to shout it from a mountaintop. It was a just one of those special mornings, you know, when you just feel closer to God. Um, that was that. That was for me this morning. Our final chorus this morning is Love You So Much, Jesus. Thanks a lot for the choruses this morning, Cliff. I'm now going to just show um, the mission video um, about uh, a couple who started the outreach program in Angola. It's a really a beautiful um, mission story. Okay. William H. and Nora Anderson were leading pioneers of Adventist mission to Southern Africa. They blazed the trail for an expanding mission throughout the southern part of the continent. After ministering and establishing work in several countries, Nora succumbed to Blackwater fever and died in South Africa. Several years later, William got remarried to Mary Elizabeth Perrin. The couple served in Angola from 1924 to 1933. William used his experience and position as superintendent of the Angola Union Mission to advance the gospel message over those nine years. The Andersons scouted future sites where they could establish mission institutions. The work was too much for just them, so other missionaries came to Angola to support the spread of the Advent message. New mission stations were established in the eastern part of the country. The Lukusi and Luz missions were opened. They offered services such as medical care and education. Through Christ's method of ministry, many people came to know the Adventist message. Today, there are more than half a million Seventh-day Adventists in Angola. Statistically, one out of every 59 people is an Adventist. One of these people is Joel. Over the course of his life, Joel explored the teachings of several Christian denominations. He had a lot of questions and never felt fully convicted by any of the teachings, but eventually settled into a congregation. 
I had a problem with my car. It was missing a part. So I had a friend from Shakati, who was an elder of the Adventist church. And I went there and asked him, find me a man that has that part. And he did it. Joel's friend asked him to join him at church the next Sabbath. After Sabbath school and the sermon, Joel was given a book that answered a lot of his questions about God. The Great Controversy. I read, read, read. Then he showed up and brought me some booklets. I read, read, absorbed it all. And then I started distributing them to the others. After reading everything he could get his hands on, Joel decided he wanted to follow Adventist principles. He took what he learned back to his church, where the whole congregation accepted the message. Today, they worship every Sabbath and continue to study God's Word. The Adventist message is spreading in Angola through various means, but there are real needs here. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will help with four projects in Angola. From building a church and an elementary school at one location to a domestic violence and counseling center at another, your offerings will help minister to those in need. Please support this offering so more people in Angola will come to know the love of Jesus. So I've often wondered how to explain what mission offering is really about. And I read on one of our websites a while ago that being a missionary is basically like being a vehicle. And our mission offering is the fuel for this vehicle. And without it, our, their attempts at spreading God's word is hampered. So I once again encourage everyone to give freely with their 13th offering and, and to make the mission offering at, at your local church. We are now going to go across to Eugene for our um, lesson study. Eugene, would you mind opening up in prayer too, please? Let us bow our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we study your word, uh, we are mindful of some of the awesomeness that's around us. Father, this world has rejected you. There's sin and evil all around us, yet you pour out rain upon us. You bless us with so many blessings, and it's for us to understand what kind of character you have. And so we thank you for that. We bring honor and praise to your name. And we ask humbly, Father, that as we study your word, that your Holy Spirit will be the instructor, that my thoughts and my words will be directly from you, and that all of us will ingest what you have to tell us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, I just want to, I don't know how to do this now, but I want to see you all. Oh, wait. Are they, okay. There we go. Okay. Just so that I have some sort of feedback. Um, so we're in... Genesis 45, it's our 13th Sabbath lesson, um, and a very pertinent lesson, I think. Um, you know, often it's difficult for us to find the practical relevance of the stuff that we study. This is, this, this is not difficult to see what the practical relevance is, because this is last day events, remnant church, living separately, it's all those themes um, thrown into one. So some lovely stuff that um, I found in there, and I hope you'll find it with me. We're in Genesis chapter 45. Um, and as you know, by now, I like to go through our lessons maybe differently to everyone else. Um, I'd like to go verse by verse. I want to see what the Bible says. Um, so we're in chapter 45, and I'll start in verse 16 to 18. That's where I'll, I'll um, start today. So 45, verse 16 to 18. Um, if 
I can ask if you can follow with me. Um, I'm going to call on you to read for me a time, but I'll start it off now um, just to, to get us going. All right, so 16 verse 18 says, when the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had, am I in the right? Yes. Um, uh, where Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan. And bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. So immediately we um, get given a strange, you know, when I say we, we want to make it practical for real life for today. So why are we called out of Canaan? Remember, uh, Jacob and them were living in Canaan out of Canaan to go to a foreign land, a land that doesn't necessarily follow God, um, different religion, different culture altogether, um, with great promises. There's the fat of the land to go there. Okay, so with that <clears throat> um, context, remember now, uh, Canaan is in severe drought. So this promised land, the 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 final promised land is not looking so good right now. The things of the world or the things of the rest or so elsewhere is looking more attractive. Okay. So this is, I can't do the accent, but you know, the famous movie, I'm going to make you an offer. You can't refuse. I think it's from the Godfather. So um, Pharaoh makes um uh, joseph an offer he can't refuse okay so that's the context okay so now we're faced with our first little controversy our first little discussion point in verse 21 to 24 we have the context now we have the scenario so here comes our first little controversy so the son verse 21 so the sons of israel did this joseph gave them carts as pharaoh had commanded and he also gave them provisions for the journey to each of them he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his jersey. Then he sent his brothers away and as they were leaving, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wasn't the, the whole issue that started this whole thing the favoritism that Jacob showed towards Joseph isn't this is what started at all. This is how you end up as a slave in Egypt because there was favoritism. So what's going on here? Why, why do you think um, Joseph is doing this? Why is he giving Benjamin better provisions and then tell them, oh, well, don't quarrel about it. Any ideas? Oh uh, yes. He's fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a trout fisherman and I know exactly how to bait uh, and, and I bait Beverly regularly and so um, uh, you know I've got to keep in, in I've got to keep my hand in so I use the bait on her just to make sure that it works and I think that's what he was doing. So are we going to accept that this is a test? I, I think so yes. You see, sometimes it's difficult for us to imagine that um, while God is working with us on an individual personal level, our lives are interconnected with everyone around us. So the plan that God's got for my life is influencing plans on other people's lives. It's like a big spider web. Okay, so God has worked with Joseph. He's remained very faithful. And Joseph wants his brothers to come to the same full understanding of God that he has, okay? Because Jacob um, seems to have a much bigger grasp on the bigger picture than the rest of his brother. So absolutely, there's, there's a test um, uh, for him, okay? But the next problem is, is that Joseph is calling his father out of Canaan, okay? Um, is this a problem? Do you think it's a problem for Jacob? Sorry, you repeat that question. So, uh, forgiveness can be unconditional, but trust is earned. Well done. Okay, that's true. That's very true. Okay, um, Joseph is very clearly we see from the Joseph is forgiven his brothers. He's got no carries no grudge. 
Um, but yeah, trust is built up in things. Okay, so the question is, uh, Joseph calls his father out of Canaan, out from this promised land, from this, um, you know, from what was supposed to be the inheritance. Do you think Jacob, as the patriarch, do you think this is a problem for him? I mean, God never mentioned Egypt as a future home. Egypt is not the promised land. I think Jacob would have had, um, he would definitely have had a problem. You know, Canaan was the promised land. He was, in fact, where he was supposed to be in his mind. Mm. Um, to go to Egypt also has connotations which aren't quite, um, as you say, it wasn't in, it said anywhere that he would land up in, in Egypt. Also, Egypt was a sort of a, a heathen land, you know, it's, it's like, why would I go from a promised land to a heathen land and, mm -hmm. and expose my whole family to, to that whole situation there? I don't know if he saw the depths of where it would go over years, where it would go into slavery. I don't know if that was actually revealed to him. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so let's put it in context of type and anti-type. Is Joseph type and anti-type of the Christ, of the Savior? Well, the lesson authors seem to make that uh, a reality, okay. and I, I do I do believe there there is a typology definitely. Yeah. So Joseph definitely is uh, anti-type of of the savior, and the the test of Joseph for his brothers giving Benjamin more the test of say trust in me, believe me, come here, I, I've got a plan. Okay. That is, God calls us to follow him regardless. Forget now about the calling out of Cain or whatever, but the trust that we must have in Christ, this is where I'm going with that. Okay, um, I'm going to move because we've got a lot to cover. We're in chapter, okay, so we're going to leave that there. Um, let's go to, okay, wait, let's jump quickly to uh, 46, chapter 46. Verse 1 to 4, I'm going to come back to 45, but 46 verse, oh, I am jumping a little bit. Forgive me. So 46 verse 1 to 4. So, so Israel set out, Israel Jacob set, set out with all that was his. And when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am. He replied, I am God, the God of your father. He said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. So here's a very, um, I say this all the time. I, I repeat it. It's like one of my things that I do in sermons is that if you want to go to heaven because it's a better option than hell, which it is, hell's going to suck. Um, but if you want to go there simply because it's a better option than hell, you're missing the point. Okay. God is saying to Jacob here, go, I, go, I will go with you. Our point of going to heaven is to be with God, not the location. The location is great, fine, golden streets, time travel, whatever. Okay. That's cool. Interplanetary travel. That's a cool. But the issue of heaven is the presence of God. We go to be with him wherever he is. Whether it's in Canaan or in Egypt, we go to be with him. Okay. <clears throat> so here's Jacob's dilemma. He's in the promised land. Let's go to 45 verse 28. 45 verse 28. Okay. Here's Jacob's response to this call to go to a foreign land. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. So he is intimating that this is not a permanent move. So I just want to go see my son before he dies. That's fine. Okay. But he's intimating that this is not a permanent move, but he's also saying, I'm going to where my son is. Okay. It doesn't matter whether he's in Egypt or Canaan. Um, I'm going to where he is. Um, and that is where I'm going to follow on with this whole idea of living separate lives, but going to where God is. Okay. All right. So Jacob doesn't see this as a permanent movie. He just says, uh, you know, I want to go 
where my son is. We're in 46 verse 1 now, right? Where we, where we we jumped a little bit. Okay, so he says, I'm going to move in 46 with one, with all I had, with everything I have. So in other words, he says it's not a permanent move, but he's not leaving anything behind. Now, all right, fair enough. They were in famine. They'd probably eaten most of their livestock by now. Um, they probably didn't have that much. I mean, Joseph actually had to send provisions with the donkeys back to go fetch his father because they were so um, starved. But they're moving. It's total commitment. It's when I move to where my God is, it's all or nothing. I don't leave anything behind. I mean, Jacob could have left something behind. He could have left a son behind or whatever, because this is the promised land and I need to keep my roots here. But when we commit to God, it's all or nothing. There's no gray area. <clears throat> okay, we're in verse 46, verse 29. Jumping quite a bit. Now it's just going, it's just the records of who all went and whatever. Okay, 46, verse 29. Is where I'm going. Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father in Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before me, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Why does Joseph send? Why does Joseph go out in his chariot? Any ideas? Well, he he, he still had to um, uh, maintain his his uh, uh, overall uh, appearance to the, uh, to, to the Egyptians themselves. So going in his chariot would have been that display. But it is at that point that, that uh, Jacob understood, um, you know, where the, 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 the sort of strength that that his son now commanded. You, you, you're spot on there because horses and chariots was a fairly new military development. Um, horses and chariot was a, it's, it's like the T-90 Russian tank, which is currently being shot to bits everywhere, but it's like the latest um, military technology. And Joseph needed to show that, look, dad, I made a success. You know, I have come from adversity and this is what I can offer you. Okay, if you, this is, I've done this. Look, look at my success. Look at the chariot, whatever. This is why I've called you here because you can do the same thing. Isn't that the same call that God makes to us? It says, I have gained the victory. Look at the marks in my hand. Well, actually the marks in my hand. Look at the marks in my hand. Um, I have conquered sin. Look at the house I prepared for you. You can have the victory too. Um, it's a great lesson for us there, I think. <laughs> I think there's another element to it. He provided the, the means by which they could come. And mm -hmm. it was a sign of his love and respect to come out and meet them. In the same way, he is a type of Christ. Christ has provided the salvation, the means, and he even comes to us. Correct. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, that's exactly right, is that... Um, the, the, the depth of this lesson for us shows us the depth of God's love because really being able to, yeah, to guide, to, to lead and guide and to show, I, I will, I'll make the provision for your journey. I'll give you all the provisions for your journey. I'll make sure you get here safely. I'll meet you on the road and I'll bring you into my home. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just gorgeous. It really is. Okay, um, so now we get to our second little bit of controversy. Um, Genesis 46, verse 31. 46, verse 31 to 34. Um, it reads, Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I'll go up and speak to Pharaoh, and I'll say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you'll be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians. What? 
what's going on here? Why, firstly, why are shepherds detestable? And secondly, why does he tell them to say that you are something detestable to Egyptian? I think it's so that they would be put into Goshen and they would be more happy there because they would be on their own and not infiltrated into the full Egyptian culture and everything else. Yeah, very clever. Um, and so again, if we take this now into our the, the, the deeper meaning for us. So there's a lot going on here. Firstly, the Egyptians were farmers. Okay, so they farmed on the floodplains of the Nile. And shepherds, livestock and shepherds, they worshipped the animals that the, that the Jews ate or the Hebrews. So, well, they weren't called Jews yet, but they, they worshipped those animals. So tending shepherds, tending flock was a detestable thing to them because it was below them. Okay. Um, Joseph has got such a great grasp of the bigger picture here. Okay. He says to them, tell them that you are shepherds because exactly what you said, Bev, is that we want to be separate. We want to live separately. Listen very carefully. Pharaoh gives them the best of the land. Now, Goshen, it's quite, there's some argument about exactly where Goshen was in terms of location, but it was at least separated. Whatever, how far it was is immaterial, but it was separate from, so it wasn't on the floodplains where the farmland was. So they weren't encroaching on the farmland of the Egyptians. It was grazed, grazed. It was the best grazing that was there. Okay. So Pharaoh gives them the best grazing of the land because well, he says it's the best, but do they they only use the grazing to for their worship animals? So, but anyway, they get the best of the land, but they are still separate. Joseph, with this great big picture of the grand scheme of things, understands what's going on, what's going to happen, because he has a very close connection with with God. Okay. So yeah, it, yes. Um, so I mean, in the previous chapter, God clearly says he'll protect them from idolatry. And I think this was the ideal method. But I think there was also another strategic part to this. When the food dries up, people eat the animals. When the animals dry up, people eat each other. And when he knew what that course of action is and where the power comes, because animals in a time of drought could become exceptionally expensive. Exactly. Um, okay, so the last thought on that, just as a matter of interest, is that, and I don't know how relevant this is, but it's interesting, Goshen was closer to Canaan than Egypt. <laughs> so geographically, maybe it was also a bit of a strategic move. But anyway, all right, we're in chapter 47. Um, and Pharaoh being true to his word, Pharaoh, okay, so again, let's just put some context here. Pharaoh in Egyptian religion, Pharaoh is the link between humanity and God. Pharaoh is a demigod or even a God. And he is the link between human and supernatural. Joseph has grown, Pharaoh has grown to respect Joseph as the link between his people and his God. Okay, because Joseph has lived a godly life, he's proved himself, and Pharaoh has come to respect jo Joseph as the link between his people and his God. So with that in mind, this is where we're going with chapter 47 now, okay? Um, Pharaoh is true to his word. He says to them, okay, fine, you can have that land, just as I said, okay? Um, and then in verse 7 to 10, something interesting happens. Okay, 47 verse 7 to 10. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage, 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. He obviously knows that his forefathers lived 900 years, whatever. <laughs> um, 
so Joseph settled his father and his brother in Egypt and gave them property and the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's house with food according to the number of their children. Um, Jacob blesses Pharaoh. What's going on here? Remember now, Pharaoh is the link in their religion. Joseph, and by default, Joseph's father, who is obviously the patriarch, is the link on this side of the religion. Jacob, uh, jo Jacob blesses Pharaoh. In truth, that should be an insult. Pharaoh should chop his head off right there. If, if we take their religion, why, why didn't he see it as an insult? Why isn't this a, I mean, a mortal can't bless a God if we put it in context. I think um, Pharaoh had seen all Joseph um, interpreting the dreams and everything else like that. So he knew, and I mean, Joseph always said, my God has given me this revelation, not me myself. Exactly. So I think that's where the connection comes in there. So it was... And the father, so can you see it? Yeah. And the father of the one who's the link between you and God, mm -hmm. you better respect. Exactly. So here's the interesting thing. Um, the, like I said, while God is working, worked with Joseph, Joseph is interlinked with all his brothers and working with them and their individual plans, joining up to a corporate plan, plan of salvation. He's also working with Pharaoh and Pharaoh has seen the works of the true God. So he's also working with Pharaoh on the individual level. He wants Pharaoh, the person Pharaoh to be saved, but he's also working through Pharaoh and all his followers. Okay. So all who come to me, you know, um, so that's really, really interesting stuff going on there. Okay. Um, also, I mean, Jacob's very old, so maybe he was just being respectful to the old bully, but whatever. <laughs> um, so this blessing is actually, there's so much to it because it's actually the true God blessing the false god or the one who thinks he's god or the one the it, it's there's so much depth to it in terms of the relevance um okay so 47 verse 12 tells us now that so now they have enough food to eat okay so they have been blessed okay everything is everything is good now except who are they being ruled by now who's leader of the land <clears throat> is this is this you're talking about now after pharaoh dies no 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 they they're living in goshen now okay but they they living are they still under a theocracy are, are they still being ruled who, who who's their allegiance to now well, the allegiance, the allegiance is still towards towards God, and through Joseph, and because he he, he is basically their ruler, um, as as the as the uh, uh, the dreams predicted. So he he's he's the ruler of the land. Essentially, he's over. What lesson? What lesson can we learn from this in our current situation? Who's who's our government now? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> is our is our government a godly government? No. Are we no. ruled by godly men? Are we ruled by God as the as the political head? No, obviously not. Okay. So how do we live in a foreign land? Um I'm going to stop at saying an evil government because whatever, but how do we live in a foreign land not being in, not in a theocracy? Um, because this is exactly how they were living. They were living under a foreign government, government, big government, big powerful. It was the power of the time. So it was the, the America of the time um, or the Russia, depending on which you see as a big power, China, maybe. <laughs> um, but they were 
a foreign land not being ruled directly by God. So there's a lesson for us on how we respond to a government or being ruled. You know, when God said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. Okay. There's the lesson is that we are not to, we to subject to those laws that are not in contradiction to God's law. I think, I think that the Bible makes it very clear when it says that live peaceably wherever you can with all men. Hmm. But at the same time, um, I think we need to take the scripture of when Christ said, be the salt of the earth, we don't know what the context was in that time. Salt had two very pertinent functions. The one was for the preservation of food. And the other one was for the stopping of disease because they didn't have a latrine system like we have today. Mm. We are called to do two things. We are there to promote good and to stop what is evil. And I would venture to say as a church, we have not stood up against evil. We are the last on the agenda when it comes to gender-based violence and many other agendas. But if, if we are true then we need to be doing both stand up against evil and promote and do what is good. This uh, Roe versus Wade that's just been overturned in the States um, is a, is a huge thing. It's a big thing. Um, and you know, your own views on abortion aside, the issue is, is that this is a massive, massive change. I was very surprised because it seems to be in contradiction to the way America is going. Um, but what it is going to do is I saw a map this morning of where you can get abortion and not abortion. And, you know, what it is doing and it's going to do is going to further the divide between conservative and liberal and between um, God fearing people. And, you know, so it, the divide is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's lessons for us to learn in how we are supposed to react under not being ruled, not in a theocracy. Um, and again, I, I want to reiterate that we are to keep the laws that are not contradictory to God's law. God's law is still our fundamental, uh, the, that's the line. But if there's a government law, so the speed limit is not in contradiction to God's law. Um, you know, paying your taxes is not in contradiction to God's law, although we can argue that we're supporting evil, but fine. All right. <laughs> can, I, can I just make a comment? Yeah. As much as um, most Christians will be rejoicing about this overturning of Roe and Wade, it is also paving the way for the legislation of morali morality, which is going to backfire on, on those of us who are truly believers of Christ. You cannot change the heart by forcing the change of behavior. And unfortunately, yes, it is going to increase the divide, but it's also paving the way for other types of legislation that are going to usher in the persecution of the saints. Mm. No, absolutely. That we are, we, things are happening. Well, things are happening lately that we would never have been able to envision 10 years ago. Um, things are happening that is quite, quite mind blowing. All right. Here's another great lesson for us. 47 verse 13 and 14, 47 verse 13 and 14. So there was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan was wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying. And he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the people of Egypt uh, so when the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is used up. So here's a really, <laughs> your, okay. So this is, this is actually what communism is. This is exactly how communism <laughs> works um, or socialism. But Joseph goes along and he buys up all the land. Okay. So he says to them, right, fine. Look, you guys don't have food. You don't have money. You can't plant, whatever. I'll buy your land, okay, which I'll give you money for your land. You'll use that money to buy seed from me because I have all the seed. You'll plant and then you can one fifth of your of your crop you must give back to me. And the four, four fifths you can keep, feed yourself and keep seed again. So super, super clever. This is great 
management. This is what government is supposed to be like, okay? This is what happens when you have a leader who is inspired by God, okay? This is what happens. This is what good government is supposed to be. And this is how taxes are supposed to work. But all right, fine, let's not get into that. The point is that um, God, Jacob, uh, Joseph, again, has this incredible vision, long-term, big picture. This guy is big-brained and he's got, because he's inspired by God, he sees the big picture. Um, and there's the lesson for us is that we, you know, I get very frustrated with little things, you know, that taxi and it's really annoying. This is not the big picture. The big picture of where the world is going, but also where we are going on an individual basis. See the big picture. See your whole life as a whole, not just as day-to-day -day things. Um, and I'm don't get me wrong. I, I don't, this is not a skill I have. This is really difficult. Okay. This is a tough thing, but this is the lesson is that God says, yeah, okay. There's things on a day-to-day -day basis, but I have a plan. Just trust me. I, I have a plan. You know, things will be, I've got it. <clears throat> okay. 46 verse 31 to 34. Uh, why am I going back? Oh, sorry. 46 verse 31 to 34. Let's just deal with that now. I don't know why I'm jumping so much. Um, 46, 46. then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's house, so I'll go up and speak to, no, wait, no, I've done, I'm on the wrong page. Sorry. Sorry. I wasn't jumping 47 verse 15 to 17, 47 verse 15 to 17. Um, when the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. And they said, then bring your livestock, said Joseph. I'll sell, your I'll sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and their goats, their cattle and their donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. What was Joseph doing with the livestock? Giving it to his father. <laughs> <laughs> who tended the livestock yeah exactly <laughs> his father and his family's importance in their economy so wait a minute those that were detestable those that were detestable now become the saviors the value the relevance what's the lesson for us there in terms of of uh, the life we live and living separately and having to turn down jobs because they've got Sabbath work or, um, you know, being weird, being off. I've just, I was getting a phone call now from someone and I rejected the phone call and send me a WhatsApp. Say, answer, I want to tell you something. I said, I'm in the church. And like, oops, it's quiet, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Living separately, and there is a reward. Our value to humanity, um, we should realize what we have to offer humanity. Um, we have the solution. We have the answer. We have the, the total solution for this world. We have in our, in our knowledge. Here it is. Um, if we hold on to it, we're very selfish. Okay. 47 verse 18 to 21. Okay. When that year was over, they came to him for the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock, belo livestock belongs to you, there's nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We and our land as well. Buy us and our land in exchange for food and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die and that the land may not become desolate. I would have loved to sit in those negotiations. <laughs> um, the, the unions have come to the, to the boss and said, look, you know, that first deal you gave us, you, you took our livestock and you gave us food. Okay. Now we've got no more livestock. Now, you know, what have we got? So they virtually, I might stop to say slaves, but they, they sell themselves as slaves um, to Oops. the Pharaoh. Yes. Serfs. Serfs, correct. Serfs. Correct. 
they 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 become serfs. However, however, was this were they badly treated? Were they mistreated? Were they no? What was the outcome? The outcome was is that they all survived. This great management directed by God meant that they all survived. Them and their families, they lived. So what's the lesson for us? I must just share, I was, re- I was listening to a rabbi who said the reason they were happy to pay was because what Joseph was asking them was actually less than the taxes they paid before. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so a better plan with a better outcome than being heavily taxed by your government. Oh, geez, there I'm going again. <clears throat> um, yeah, okay. That's actually a reference then, Genesis 41, about the taxes. Um, but Eugene? Yes. Joseph was a very fair man. Why was this not considered before the time? Why not give them the seed before the time? <laughs> Okay, but hang on. He, remember that they had the seven years of famine and seven years of drought. So what did what happened during the seven years of, of the seven years of prosperity? What did they do? If he gave them the seed, they would have eaten it. Mm. So he stored, he stored so much. Um, by the way, if you know anything about farming, storing grain is not the easiest thing to do, eh? Because oh. um Grain is a huge attraction for rats, mm-hmm. and with rats come all disease, and there's uh, those little fly m- things that go into the grain. There's mold. Storing grain is not an easy thing to do. Storing grain for seven years, I would love to know how he stored it, um, because storing grain is a is a nightmare um, to keep it alive. You know, to keep it not rotting. Yeah, so, if, you, if you if you look at some of the um, uh, the architectural uh, excavations that have occurred in Egypt, they found a lot of the silos where grain was stored. In fact, there's still some grain there even now. Wow, uh, it was really fascinating. I, I watched a video a while back. Um, these silos were um, uh, limited to uh, approximately 300 tons. Of, of of grain per silo so they, they must have been literally thousands of these silos they've only found a few of them but some mm. of them still had viable um a, a grain in them wow and and I mean, you know you're talking you're talking um a, a, a couple of thousand years yeah yeah um, look, I mean, the, the climate would have helped. The very dry climate would have kept the wetness out. But still, it is a monumental task to store that grain, keep rats out, keep... Um, so it, it talks to management. It talks to superb, superb management, okay? And our governments without God cannot manage the economy. That's the fact. There's no... The, this kind of management is by divine inspiration. Um, I, I have no qualms about saying that because um, the, 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 the awesomeness of this, of Joseph's management. We, by the way, can you think of another leader who managed the government so well in the Bible? virtually exactly the same thing he was not the king but he was kind of the king because he ruled in fact he ruled at one stage he ruled for seven years while the king was mad remember daniel daniel yeah Had to be daniel. the same thing he managed so well that he actually was appointed by three successive kings is it because he was such a oh, sure he was a clever man i'm not doubting that but because he was taking his instruction from god yeah um I wish, and, and, I, and I, I, I have to say it, he was an honest person. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there is, there is <sighs> the value of I, I, I could only, I can only hope and dream for that day when we will be managed, when our government will be God, um, when 
you know, when we come back to the new earth and we're farming and our, our government is, is God directly and we don't have these people pocketing their stuff. Okay. Just All right. So this, yes. That struck me. You know, I've been involved with wealthy most of my life. And there's three things that are really critical to help others. One is you need the capacity. You must know whether you actually have the resources to help. The second, you must have understanding of why those people are in the position they're in and not feed Satan's methods of doing the right thing. Because some people are in the position they're in because they're not following how God made the universe to work. And then you also need wisdom and insight to to help those people change and for to change circumstances and think strategically and that element is critical and it only comes from god mm, couldn't couldn't have said it better myself that's exactly right is um when you when you don't allow god to to direct your decisions you're going to make poor decisions. It's just as simple as that. You just don't have that skill. It's not. I don't think it's something that necessarily comes naturally. I think um, management is a require is an a, is an acquired skill. It's a developed skill, but you can develop bad management just as well as you can develop good management. Um, you can get worse. You can right. you can really become an evil person. Um, Celia, how much time have I got? When do I need to finish? No, you've still got quite a while. We only need to finish when you're done. Five to ten, oh, five to eleven, eleven o'clock. Okay. All right. Let's go to um okay, we've dealt with the crops. Forty-seven, where are we? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Forty-seven verse twenty-three. Um, Joseph said to the people, Now that I've bought your land today for for Pharaoh. <laughs> Not for myself or for my people. For Pharaoh, here is seed for you so you can plant the ground. But when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for yourself and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. Um, and they respond by, you have saved our lives. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. <laughs> so two things happens here. Firstly, um, we get taught a little lesson about tithe. Well, about twentieth tithe, twentieth, twentieth. Um, they pay twenty percent tithe. These people, <laughs> um, but they respond. They recognize that this tithing is uh, saving their lives. Okay, they they recognize that. But who do they acknowledge? There it says it in. Um, Verse 25, you have saved our lives. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord, small L, our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Is this a failure of the gospel? Has the gospel not reached these thick skulled, thick headed, stubborn people? I don't think so. I mean, they'd negotiated and it was always they they are selling themselves to Pharaoh. So I think they're showing themselves as quite honorable. What happened when the Israelites left? Were there Egyptians that went with? Yes. Very definitely. Absolutely. Okay. There was lots of Egyptians that left with them. Here are the roots for those conversions. Those conversions, generational conversions, okay? Because, I mean, this is 400 years they were in, in Goshen. So generational conversions, families who have, who have converted and follow converted, and those families left with, they're saying, I'm going with you because this is the real God. These are the roots. So sometimes we don't see the effects of our testimony or our, our and we get depressed. I mean, I was in ministry and it, bothered me a lot um, that I could have a revelation seminar in Howick Town Hall and pack out that hall every night for six nights. Every single person came, didn't miss a lecture and not one baptism. Okay. And that, that really bothered me. It's like, you know, because as ministers, you get judged by your numbers, by that's your success rate. And so it really depressed me. But the truth is, 
big picture, guys, big picture. We have to know that God works with a plan and the seeds that we plant, we probably never will. Sometimes you might see it, but great. But the seeds that you plant, you might never see them grow. Um, you know, people that, I don't know how many people I've preached to, who knows what they've uh, ingested? Who knows what the Holy Spirit has put on their heart? It's not for me to tell. Um, it's not my job even. It's not my problem, actually, after that, to be honest. So um, sometimes, like I say, we, we're quite hard on ourselves and like, we, you know, fighting a dead battle. And we seem to be closed down at every avenue because you're not allowed to speak about religion. You're not allowed to, to um, <clears throat> sometimes our testimony, like we have a huge, we have load shedding, we have huge issues of power here. And my counselor just put a notice on the, this morning put a notice on that the, the, the um, uh, her steel exchange, the, the power supply place, whatever they call contribute thing. They have 980 open calls that they're trying to deal with. Okay. So I put on there as a joke, really, because that's as far you can go. It's like, let's pray for them. <laughs> Because, I mean, I don't know how they cope with 900 calls. But the point is, that's about where our religion goes. We're going to make a joke on the group because, I mean, there's Muslims and Hindus, all sorts of people on that group, you know. So, But sometimes we feel that we're blocked. Um, we don't really get anywhere. But it's not our problem. God is working with a long-term, big-picture plan. Yeah, you know, it's like you were saying, um, uh, 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 God is working with an enormous number of people. All at the same time, you know. If, if you think of a of a chess set, uh, you, you've you've got sixty four squares, and and you've got these little men that you are shifting from place to place. And look at all the possibilities. I mean, the possibilities are almost endless. Mm. But God is working with billions. <laughs> Not <laughs> He's working with billions of pieces. Exactly. These ones and those ones, you, there's no way you can possibly see that plan. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to chapter 48. Let me make the last, just the last interesting point about chapter 47. Um, Joseph says to them that you must go, here's your, pay your tax and you go keep the rest for yourself and whatever. Is Joseph telling them how to plant or where to plant? No. No, so, I think. I think something worth noting here is speaking to Cecilia's question. Joseph knew now that it was safe to entrust them with their own seed to plant again. Okay. It wasn't before. And I think that also was a divine wisdom. Exactly. Just in terms of a modern application, it's still a free market economy. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, God doesn't, uh, he, he, it, like you said uh, earlier, it is about trust. Okay, it is God does we are going to trust God, but we've also got to be uh, mindful of the trust that's been placed in us. So we've been given talents, and we have to cultivate those talents. God doesn't tell us how; He doesn't tell us; He does not prescribe them that way. But we have a responsibility as well um, in terms of um, working with the things that've been given to us. God trusts us with those. All right, let's move to chapter 48. Um, and so I'm going to skip a little bit. We go, we start in verse 8, 48, verse 8 to 11. Okay. Um, when Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he said, who are these? And he says, these, they are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. And Israel said, bring them to me and I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see so Joseph brought his sons close to him and his father kissed them and embraced them. Um, and Israel said to Joseph, I'll never expect to see your face again. And now God has allowed me to see your children too. So Joseph actually married someone, obviously, um, and had kids with them. And here, Jacob, the patriarch, um, it reminds me of that, that deception of uh, Esau, you know, and the going in and letting him feel the, the hairy skin um, it sort of reminds me of that whole thing. But here Jacob comes and blesses Joseph's sons um, and makes them part of the tribe. 
because I'm assuming, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming that he married an Egyptian woman. Um, and so they were... Uh, uh, yes, Eugene, he married, yeah. he married the daughter of the high priest. Oh, that's right. Sorry, you're right. Yes, 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 yes that's right. Sorry, Jade. Uh, Pharaoh gave her, gave her to him as a wife. So there she we go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, uh, you that you reminded me. That's correct. Okay. So they were half breeds. Uh, that sounds very derogatory, but they weren't Jewish. Uh, they weren't from the tribe. But here Jacob blesses them and brings them into the tribe. What does that tell us about the remnant church? Are we exclusive? Are we somehow specially blessed and no one else is allowed? Of course not. Okay, so um, spiritual Jews being baptized into the body of Christ. Um, there's a great little lesson for us there. Um, remember what I always say, there's no reason, there's no verse that's not there on purpose, okay? Like you ask, why do we need to know this? Well, there's the lesson for us. So the type, just quickly, is obviously Joseph wasn't the born. He wasn't born first, but he got the blessing of the firstborn, which mm. then was sent given on to his children, and that's how we too receive the double portion that Christ has gotten for us. Amen. Amen. Um. All right, so Jacob manages to raise himself up to give the blessing because God's spirit is still strong in him. Um, God directs his actions. Uh, all right, 48 verse 20 to 21. 48 verse 20 to 21. Um, he blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Wait, what, what's going on? I don't, I don't quite understand this. Um, what, what's going on here? Does anybody have any ideas about this? So a lot of people don't understand what it means to be the firstborn. It doesn't mean that you naturally, literally the firstborn. And I believe at this point, Isaac himself um sorry Jacob himself had realized how God actually operates that's why he gave Joseph the blessing of the firstborn the firstborn is about character and about the benefits that come with that and so just like he pronounced over his sons it wasn't prophetic he could see the writing on the wall of where they were the trajectory of their lives and what they'd done and the impact of that even on their children because he himself had been a product of, of all of that. And I believe that in this particular case, God led him through divine wisdom and insight to do what he did. Thank you. That, that kind of explains it to me as well. It makes sense because I, it was quite a little bit confusing for me and that I was thinking that there must be some sort of extra story um to this that i that i don't have you know i don't know all the answers um i want to just quickly look at uh exodus 12 i don't know why i wrote this down i can't remember why i wrote this down i want to just quickly look exodus 12 verse 50 to 51 um why i've this exodus 12 verse 50 to 51, all the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. Okay, I can't remember why I wrote that down. Maybe it was just an issue of obedience or an issue of tribes. I can't remember. Okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> so Jacob... Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. That's why it was. Okay, so uh, this this Exodus, uh, Genesis 47, verse 20 to 21, 48, verse 20, 21. In your name, Israel will pronounce this blessing. May God be like, uh, may you like be like Ephraim. And so Ephraim put ahead of man. That is a prophecy that Jacob pronounced, okay? And the fulfillment of the prophecy is in Exodus 13. Okay, it started, that's why I had the, sorry, I should have read further, hey? 
Um, all the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. Exodus 13, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. There we go. Um, uh, Jay, you spot on. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belonged to me, whether man or animal. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, you, you actually said it very eloquently. I was confused there for a minute. I write the stuff down and I... I just thought I'd read to you from the um, the remedy version. It says, then Israel said to Joseph, it's my time to die, but God will be with you all and to take you all back to the land of your fathers. To you who lived above your brothers in integrity, I give the fertile region of Shechem. Beautiful. That, that they don't deserve for their actions there and which I defended against the Amorites with my sword and bow. Awesome. Okay. That, that is, I couldn't have said a bit more. That explains it all to us. Okay. So that's, thank you for redirecting my thoughts there. I was flailing. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, what is the, this favoritism or uh, favoritism, but this putting the, the firstborn is not necessarily the one that comes out the womb first. The firstborn, the blessing of the firstborn is the one who lives in integrity, as you so eloquently said. Remember the test that Joseph gave to his brothers when he sent them back to go fetch? He said, here's more for Benjamin, okay? You know, there's, you get five sets of clothes and 300 shekels of silver. Don't quarrel. Can you see that this test of integrity is ongoing? Um, as Adventists, we believe that we're in the investigative judgment. What does the investigative judgment mean to us? Um, not just us, the whole world, Okay. Um, this test of integrity, this, am I, <laughs> um, this idea that some people will get a greater blessing or some people will, um, you know, have extra stars in their crown. Does that bother me? <laughs> For me? No. I, if, if I could, if I, as long as I can sit at the table, if it's the furthest, furthest point in the table, you know, the table is going to be like hundreds of kilometers long because there's many millions of people sit at that table. And if God sits at the head of the table, if I'm at the furthest, furthest table, that's fine as long as I'm there. Okay. I don't, as long as I'm there, as long as that, when he's, when he's spoken to everyone, seven billion, whoever's going to be there. And he just passes by me and I can just touch the hem of his cloak. I'm fine. I'm, I don't need to have stars in my crown. Um, but yeah, this, this special blessing, um, this favoritism with that we on, in, in earthly ideas think is a bad thing. Um, we need to understand it from God's point of view. We need to understand what blessing is. And, and in fact, we can rejoice in other people's blessings. Um, you know, we're very inward looking, we're very selfish, very narcissistic in this modern world. And so it's me, 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 and I, I, I. And so when we see God blessing other people, we're jealous. Instead of rejoicing, we should rejoice in other people's blessings too. Um, because that's what love is. That's what intercommunity, inter, that's what, love in terms of a community a, a community in christ the body of christ um all right let's finish this up with the end of jacob last last but we're in genesis chapter 50 um finish it off uh verse one two three joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him this is jacob now um dying threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him then joseph directed the physician in his service to embalm his father um, so the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was a time required for embalming. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. Sorry, who mourned for him? The Egyptians, yeah. That's very interesting. Wait, the Egyptians mourned for him. Can you see the influence that we have um, without us even realizing it? Um, the Egyptians mourned for him. Seventy. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, if I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him my father made me swear an oath and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Okay. So remember in the beginning, we, Jacob made it very clear that moving to Egypt is a temporary thing. And he asked Joseph earlier on, please, when I die, bury me, not in the foreign land, bury me in the promised land. Um, 
And what does Pharaoh say? Verse 6 says, Pharaoh says, go up and bury your father as he made you swear you do. Pharaoh still, okay, I think after the death of Joseph, um, things went south a little bit for the Israelites. But the point is that this Pharaoh in particular has seen, by beholding we become changed. He has seen the true God and he has seen um, the effects of godly rulership and, 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 and worship to the true God. And Joseph can almost do no wrong. Joseph can pretty much ask for anything. Um, okay, but remember the... Israelites supposedly are still. <laughs> what did what did uh, what was the whole thing in America with the elections? What was the word that oh deplorables deplorables? Okay, the, the the Israelites were deplorables. They were shepherds, detestable people. Yet they have grown to be respected. And yet when they left, is some Egyptians went with them. So. The influence that we have, the big picture, the spreading of the gospel, the planting of the seed, we, we need to, to keep that in mind. Okay, verse 5 to 8. Um, I have read some of it. My father made me swear an oath. Okay, he says, go up and bury your father. Verse 7, so Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt. Besides all the member of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household, only their children and their flocks and their herds were left in Goshen. Whoa, that is a big funeral. Okay. That is a monstrous funeral. Um, that includes the heathen, if we, for want of a better word. Okay. So the effect of a godly life. Even the evil, you know, that verse that says every knee will bow. Um, every knee will bow. Every knee will acknowledge that he's the true God. His solution was the best. His son did die for us. Um, every knee will bow. There's the lesson for us. Um Okay, I need to finish. So let me skip that. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think let's leave it there because I'm going, I'm almost finished. I've pretty much got through it. Um, there's just, uh, so God was blessing them in Egypt. Um, they, they think they were waiting for God to give them specific direction to return to Canaan. Um, 400 years seems like a very long time to wait for directions. Um, maybe that's the thought I'll close off with, is that 160 years now, odd, we, since the time of the Great Disappointment, and um, it sometimes seems like such a long time. You know, we it, it, there's so little joy and happiness in this world around us. Um, you know, I, I have this joke that I always say when I see horrible things like I don't want to live on this planet anymore but it's true we don't want to live on this planet anymore it's really just not become a pleasant place however we have a job to do and and there is joy and peace and good things to be had whilst on remember God is not saying it will be fine one day he's saying I'll work with you now I'll give you great peace of they that have understanding there's there's peace beyond human understanding um, in God. And so we can find great peace. I, my happy places with my family, when my kids are here, you know, that's my happy place. So there is joy and peace to be found if we just allow God. I think the thought I want to leave with you is um, big picture. Think big picture. Think long term. Think about interconnected plans. God working with your life. But while he's working with you, you are influencing other people's lives. It, big spider web of plans and there's an happy ending yeah it's it's uh it, it's uh, thanks eugene it was a really great lesson uh, it's just one thing i wanted to uh, say is it's very interesting that uh, if you look in um, uh, chapter 50 verse 2 and it, uh, it says and joseph commanded his servants the physicians 
to embalm his father, blah, 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 and, he, and, and what they did. And then he went, uh, he went to Pharaoh and he said, if I have favor in your eyes, you know, he still knew his place. He still, humble. He still had that humbleness towards Pharaoh. Yep. And yet he still commanded the entire Egyptians. Yep. Uh, you know, the, everybody. So he, he never, in all that time, lost his place. He never came bigger than his boots. There's, there's great lessons for us to be learned that, you know, especially for me. I mean, my problem with authority. <laughs> um, but but being gracious and being you know accepting that God is ultimately in control, no matter how evil we might think the government is or whatever, God is still ultimately in control. And being gracious and being a good Christian, you know, someone who when that policeman jumps out and stops me, you know, I'm, I'm immediately angry. But I shouldn't be. I should be. I should reflect God's character. Um, so I think there's great lessons for us to be learned. Um, certainly from this story, um, but in terms of who we are as a remnant church, who we are as a people, our interaction with the world around us, um, and just trusting firstly in what God has said he will do and trusting and, and responding to that trust with what he's given entrusted to us. Um, let us bow our heads. <laughs> Father, your word is such a wealth, such a depth of, of awesomeness and beauty and, and lessons to be learned. And as we can see from the type and anti-type here in Joseph's life and the long-term plan that you worked and the true to your word lessons that we can learn from this, Father, we just want to stand in awe and wonder of who you are. Um, we want to bring praise and honor and worship to you, Father, um, better than we can't do it by ourselves we want to be invoked by the holy spirit so that we can respond to your love properly because you are just that awesome and you are the only solution to this dying world so help us father to not only accept that solution but to share that solution with the world around us not be selfish with it um thank you for your love thank you for your kindness thank you for your word and thank you for my friends here who've also come to worship at your throne and my prayer as we leave now is, Father, that you will not pass us by, that we will just be able to touch the hem of your cloak and experience your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Eugene, thank you so 